So I want to introduce our next speaker. He's the MC for the event. His name is Alex Newman. And Alex Newman uh, writes for the New American Magazine. He also writes for the Epoch Times. He's been a well-known public speaker across the country on so many topics it's not even funny. Uh, he does a show called Behind the Deep State. He does all kinds of other shows. He owns a media company. Uh, he speaks everywhere on all kinds of topics. And so I said, Alex, what do you want to speak on? And he goes, anything you want, because he's that good. And so I wanted him to speak on the oath of office. I swore an oath. Now, I want the mainstream press to listen up, because this is one of the keys to the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association. It's a key component of our training. Sheriffs, public officials, from the dog catcher all the way to the President of the United States, you guys swear an oath, an allegiance, fidelity to the Constitution for the United States of America. And that means you will protect America, you will stand with the Constitution, you will protect the citizens and their rights from enemies, foreign and domestic. Alex is going to explain the oath, what it means. He's going to break it down in a meaningful way. And then he's going to ask you all to keep it. The citizens can do it voluntarily. But when you're elected, you must take the oath to uh, be sworn in, right? Sworn in. Isn't that interesting? And so I personally want you to know that I'm willing to take the oath. I'm willing to stand for the Constitution. And I'm willing to die for this country if necessary. I pray that it's not a hill I'm supposed to die on, but I'm that dedicated to the sacred cause of liberty, and so is our next speaker, Mr. Alex Newman. Thank you, Sam, and thanks, everybody, for being here. Again, it's a tremendous honor and pleasure to be able to speak with you. Um, so we're, we're talking about the oath today, you know, and, and a lot of people just consider it like a formality. It's just a piece of paper that we have to file away. It's just a, a formal mechanism that we have to use to make sure that uh, we're complying with all the rules and regulations. But the reality is the oath is sacred. When you swear to protect the Constitution of the United States from all enemies, foreign and domestic, if you're going into the military, when you swear to protect the Constitution of the United States and your state when you're going into law enforcement um, or, or even serving in your state legislature, that means something. And uh, until recently, everybody always said, so help me God. They used to put their hands on the Bible. A lot of us still do that. And I want to give you... A little bit of the background on this today, because th it's actually not a uniquely American innovation. Uh, and, and I would say the first step in truly understanding the oath of office is actually to read the Constitution that you are swearing an oath to uphold and protect. Uh, I've talked to so many lawyers across this country, and I say to them, hey, you spent years and years in law school. Did you ever read the Constitution? And so far, every single time, Every single lawyer I have asked, did you read the Constitution in law school? The answer has been no. We did not read the Constitution. We read case law. We read statutes. We read opinions from judges. But you didn't read the Constitution. Well, the Constitution is called the supreme law of the land. The Constitution is what you are taking an oath to uphold. And so step one is going to be you've got to read your Constitution. If you're not reading your Constitution, how in the world could you possibly put your hand on a Bible and swear, so help me God, to uphold it. Now, the Constitution is not that difficult of a document to understand. The, the legal profession wants you to think it's difficult to understand, that it has to be interpreted in light of all these things. Uh, just read it, right? And, and if you're concerned about a word, I actually have a, a dictionary that's really, really good. It was published back in the 1820s. The first American dictionary was written by uh, Noah Webster. Really, really great dictionary. If you wonder what does a word mean, what did it mean at that time, read that dictionary. The idea that judges can amend the Constitution by reinterpreting words or looking at words as the way they are today or looking at it in a cultural context in today, uh, that's absolutely outrageous. That's not what you're doing when you're swearing an oath to uphold the Constitution. What you're supposed to be doing is upholding the Constitution as it is written. Now, we do have a process for changing the Constitution for those who want to change it. Uh, there's a procedure for doing that. You can find it in Article 5 of the Constitution. And for the people out there who think the government ought to be doing X, Y, or Z that it's not allowed to, that's the proper mechanism for changing the way the system operates. It's not through judicial decisions. It's not through uh, statutory law. 
It is through an amendment process. So we need to read the Constitution as step one. We need to understand the Constitution. What does it mean? Now, you can actually simplify this quite a bit. The federal government has a specific list of things that it is authorized to do. In Article 1, Section 8, you'll find most of those things. These are the powers of Congress. And uh, what you'll find if you read this list of things they're allowed to do is that the vast majority of what the federal government is doing today is unconstitutional. And that's where our state governments and our sheriffs need to come in and actually enforce the Constitution as written and as they swore an oath to do. Now, the idea of a lesser magistrate standing up to a higher magistrate is not new. In fact, it's a biblical idea, and we'll go into some of that. But it's also what our founding fathers said would be the rightful remedy for dealing with abuses from the federal government. Uh, very early on in our history, we had um, a Congress that did not necessarily respect the Constitution. They passed the Alien and Sedition Acts, and as part of these Alien and Sedition Acts, they wanted to silence people. They wanted to basically uh, run roughshod over the Constitution. And so Thomas Jefferson, the primary author of our Declaration of Independence, and James Madison, the father of our Constitution, both drafted documents, the Virginia and the Kentucky Resolutions, where they said that the rightful remedy to abuses of the Constitution by the federal government was for state governments to nullify or to interpose between the abuser, in this case the federal government, and the citizens. I encourage you to read the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions if you have not yet. But I want to go back in history a little bit because these ideas were not new. These ideas were not unique to Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, the founders of our country. Uh, in fact, they go way back, and we'll get into some of the biblical history. But first, let's get into some of the immediate history. What preceded the founding of the United States? Well, the English Civil War was a turning point in human history. There had been a debate for a very long time about whether the law was king or the king was law. They called it Lex Rex is the law king or Rex Lex, is the king the law? And of course, the king thought he was the law. The king thought he was the supreme law, and nobody but him could understand it, interpret it, make it, etc. And so he actually, King Charles I, tried to dissolve parliament back in 1642, and Christians fought back. They said, no, you can't do that. You are not the law. You are also subject to the law. And we'll get into the source of the law in a moment. They actually pointed back to the Magna Carta from 1215. They said, hey, you don't have the power to dissolve parliament. You don't have the power to do the things that you want to do. And so the members of parliament, as the lesser magistrates, they put their neck out and they said, no, we're not going to let you do that. They actually charged the king with treason. True story. Can they do that? Well, they did do that. They charged the king with treason. And they went to war under the leadership of Oliver Cromwell, a lesser magistrate who decided that, no, we're not going to tolerate these abuses. The king is not the law. The law is the king. And even the king must obey the law. Even, in our context, the president, even the Congress, even the Supreme Court of the United States must obey the law. That's what their oath of office required. And so this war broke out, very interesting, under the leadership of Oliver Cromwell. He handed all of his forces a Bible and a sword. Now, if you go to the British Parliament today, you'll see two statues outside of the British Parliament. One is Oliver Cromwell. Two guys outside British Parliament. One is Oliver Cromwell. And uh, he actually raised this army, the parliamentary forces, and they went to war against the man they called a traitor, King Charles I. As this war went on for a few years, laid the groundwork for more civil liberties in the United States, but they put King Charles on trial for treason. They found him guilty, and they took off his head. Now, I'm not suggesting that we're there yet, right? Uh, but the point was, no, the king is not the law. The king is subject to the law. The law is king. Uh, and this is very much what our founding fathers had in mind when they created our country. They didn't want a king. They wanted everybody to be subject to the law. And if you go back in our history, what you'll find is they understood the law actually comes from our creator. The supreme law that all other law must be based on comes from the Bible. Uh, and the Anglo-Saxon world has a long tradition of this. If you go back to the 800s, this is incredible, King Alfred, not a lot of people know about King Alfred today anymore, but he created really a wonderful Christian legal code. He took uh, ideas from the Ten Commandments, he took ideas from the book of Exodus, he took ideas from the Sermon on the Mount, he took ideas from the Acts of the Apostles, and he created his code of law. This was a very, very significant document, uh, not just in Anglo-Saxon history, but in the history of the world. And if you go through the laws that he put down, what you'll find is some of these will be very familiar to you. Your rights come from your creator. Wow, where did we hear that? 
equal justice for all. We're going to decentralize power. We're going to protect the rights of the individual, the family, and the church. Now, if you're not familiar with King Alfred, uh, Winston Churchill, in his history of the English-speaking peoples, he said, King Alfred's book of laws, as set out in the existing laws of Kent, Wessex, and Mercia, attempted to blend the Mosaic Code with Christian principles and old Germanic customs. And that's exactly what they did. Now, 300 years later, you had King John behaving like a dictator. And again, the lesser magistrates stepped in and said, look, you cannot do those things. You don't have the authority to just kill people or take people's stuff. Why? Because God said, thou shalt not murder. God said, thou shalt not steal. And I don't care if you're a king. I don't care if you have a fancy thing on your head. You are not superior to God. You don't get to kill. You don't get to steal. And so they actually held him at sword point. They took the king and they held him at sword point. With the help of the Archbishop of Canterbury, Stephen Langton, they wrote uh, what would eventually become called the Magna Carta. This was in June 15, 1215. 25 barons held the king at sword point. They called themselves the Army of God. And they surrounded the King John at Runnymede and they forced him to sign this document, the Magna Carta. It's known as the Great Charter of English Liberties, which of course helped lay the foundation for our nation and eventually our constitution as well. And they told King John, if you will not obey this, we will declare war on you and that will be the end of your rulership. Now again, if you go back and read the Magna Carta, what you'll find is some of this stuff will look very familiar to you, right? That our constitution was not written in a vacuum. Uh, the Magna Carta enshrined, among other things, rights and liberties for the church. It enshrined a right to petition for redress of grievances. It enshrined no taxation without common counsel, in other words, consent of the governed. It said no excessive fines or punishments could be levied. It forbid the taking of private property without just compensation. It established the need for credible witnesses to be able to deprive somebody of their rights. And it declared that there must be due process of law, that people must have a right to a speedy trial. Some of this should sound familiar, at least if you're at all familiar with our American history. It ends like this, by the way, for the salvation of our souls and the souls of all our heirs and unto the honor of God. So that is our heritage. And by the way, uh, the Magna Carta has been cited by the U.S. Supreme Court over 100 times in its rulings and opinions. Um, the Massachusetts Assembly, uh, in response to the British Stamp Act, actually said this Stamp Act was a violation of the Magna Carta and the natural rights of Englishmen. So what did they do? They interposed between the British authorities and the people of their colony. Now, I want to talk about the biblical background here, too, because uh, these guys were not coming up with something new and revolutionary. What they were doing was actually following the model laid out for God's people in the Bible. And this starts at the very beginning. If you go back to the book of Exodus, there's a really interesting story. It's in Exodus chapter 1. You'll read about the Hebrew midwives. So Pharaoh had ordered the Hebrew midwives to kill all the baby boys. They're not people anyways, right? They're just a clump of cells. No, I don't imagine he said that. But they said, you got to kill all the Hebrew baby boys. And so the midwives, here's what the Bible says in Exodus 1. It says, if it be, the Pharaoh said, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But the midwives, it says, feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And therefore God was really mad at them because they must not have been reading Romans 13. No, right? Uh, the Bible goes on to say, therefore God dealt well with the midwives. He dealt well with the midwives who defied Pharaoh and refused to kill the baby boys. Actually, the people multiplied and waxed very mightily. And what you'll find is that all throughout the scriptures, it's a history of God's people standing up against wicked decrees, against wicked rulers, and keeping their oath to God. So in Exodus chapter 5, we have Moses demanding the release of Pharaoh's people, or the, the slaves that Pharaoh had captured. Uh, in 1 Kings, we have Elijah rebuking King Ahab for his evil policies and standing against the wickedness that he had unleashed for the worship of demons. Right? And then uh, we have this incredible story in Daniel chapter 3. Considering what we're living through right now, I think everybody ought to memorize Daniel chapter 3. It's an incredible story. Uh, God's people were being punished for infidelity, for idol worship, and other things. And so God uh, used Nebuchadnezzar to take his people into captivity. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar, this king, the most powerful king in the world, actually set up this big, huge golden idol. It's an amazing story. 
chapter 3, starting in verse 4 and 6. Uh, and then a herald for the king said to everybody, hey, when you hear the sound of the music, you need to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And whoever doesn't fall down and worship shall that same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So here you have God's people. And these were high-ranking officials, right? Saying, uh, no, actually, we're not. Here's how they responded. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So here you have them keeping their oath to God. No, we're not going to bow down to your golden idol. No, we're not going to participate in this wickedness that God has forbidden. We're not going to do it. And then what happened? Well, God was really mad because they didn't read Romans 13. No. <laughs> Romans 13 came much later. Uh, and uh, it says... Continuing in Daniel chapter 3, they got thrown into the fiery furnace. The king actually made it seven times hotter than it usually is. And whoa, walking in the midst of the fire, there was a fourth man. And the form of the fourth is like the son of God. And then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and said, Ye servants of the most high God, come forth and come hither. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill because there is no other god that can deliver after this sort. So here you have God's people upholding their metaphorical oath and saying, no, we're not going to comply with this wicked policy. And what did God do? He protected them, and he used their courage, and he used their defiance to bring the king to his senses. Now, can our sheriffs do that today? I don't know. Maybe. Will Biden come to his senses if enough sheriffs across this country say, hey, we're going to uphold our oath of office. We're not going to let you terrorize our constituents. We're not going to let you act like you are the law rather than subject to the law. Will that fix the problem? I don't know. But it's worked in history before. And there are many other examples of God's people. Uh, if you read continuing in Daniel, you have in Daniel chapter 6, Daniel himself disobeys the wicked decree from the king. The king had been duped into passing a law that nobody could worship or pray to any god other than the king. And so Daniel actually went up into his apartment and flagrantly violated. He actually opened his window so everybody could see his defiance. And he prayed. He kneeled down and prayed. And um, guess what? He did get thrown into the lion's den. But I think we all know what happened next. God protected him from this wicked, wicked decree. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we have Paul fleeing arrest. And then in Acts chapter 5, we have a really interesting story. God's people brought before the authorities... And the high priest said, didn't we command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Ladies and gentlemen, when you think of your oath of office to the Constitution, when you think of the founding of this country, our founding fathers did call these ideas self-evident truths, and they are. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to recognize that we have a right to life. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to recognize you have a right to property. Our founding fathers understood these rights came from God, and they called it a self-evident truth. But ultimately, these are biblical ideas as well. Where did they get the idea that you had a right to life? Well, God said, thou shalt not murder. Pretty clear. That's why you have a right to life. And yet it's self-evident too, but it's a biblical idea. What else did they say? That you have a right to property, right? Where'd they get that idea? Thou shalt not steal. So when you take an oath to the Constitution, the Constitution is based on principles that come directly from our Creator. And if you don't believe me, one of the most important speeches that I ever read, I cannot recommend it highly enough, uh, was a speech that was given in 1788 by Samuel Langdon. He was the head of Harvard University back when Harvard was a decent educational institution. And I know people struggle to believe that these days, but it's true, it was. Um, and he was telling the New Hampshire legislature that they ought to vote in favor of the U.S. Constitution. 
and he was explaining why they ought to vote in favor of the U.S. Constitution. His speech was called The Republic of the Israelites, an example to the American states. And what he explains in this, I, I could never think about the Constitution the same after reading this speech. What he explains to them is that the principles of government enshrined in the Constitution actually come from the Scriptures. In particular, they come from what God revealed to the ancient Hebrews. Uh, and here's what he, one of the things he said, and I encourage you to read this speech. If I can give you homework, it would be to read this speech. He says, wisdom is the gift of God, and social happiness depends on his providential government. Therefore, if these states have framed their constitutions with superior wisdom and secured their natural rights and all the advantages of society with greater precaution than other nations, we may with good reason affirm that God has given us our government, that he has taught us good statutes and judgments, tending to make us great and respectable in the view of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our heritage. When you're taking an oath to the Constitution, it's not just a piece of paper, as George Bush reportedly called it one time. Uh, it is based on timeless principles and moral truths that God has revealed to us through the Scriptures and through creation. It is a sacred oath. When we say it's a sacred oath, it is literally a sacred oath. That's why our forefathers always insisted you put your hand on the Bible when you swear that oath. And we need to keep that in mind. Now, the liberals have actually gotten better in many cases than conservatives at standing up against the higher magistrates. Uh, you know, they all over the country, they're flagrantly defying federal law. They're doing it right this moment, right? The federal statute right now says you can't have a marijuana plant. That's a federal crime. Guess what? Virtually every Democrat state in this union has said, yeah, that's a nice federal law. It's not constitutional. We're not going to be uh, doing that in our state. Started with Colorado, California, Oregon, Washington. How is it that the liberals can stand between the out-of-control federal government and their citizens, but conservatives are demonized as insurrectionists if they stand for the Constitution that they swore an oath to uphold. Ladies and gentlemen, our country is in grave danger. We have a government that, like King Charles, recognizes no bounds and no boundaries on its authority. The only way we're going to be able to remind the federal government that there are boundaries to its authority is by having states and sheriffs and law enforcement officials and city governments and county governments say, no, you cannot do that. And if you go back to our founding fathers, uh, obviously the, the Bible was the most cited uh, book in all the writings of our founding fathers, but they took a lot of ideas from other places as well. Uh, one of the guys that they got a lot of their ideas from, he's actually the most quoted legal scholar by our founding fathers, was named William Blackstone. And he says something very interesting. Um, his book, uh, Commentaries on the Laws of England, uh, this again was the most cited legal book by our founding fathers, said the higher law upon which all laws are based and must be based is God's law. He said there are those superior laws that come from God that all people everywhere are commanded to obey. And he says upon these two foundations, the law of nature and the law of revelation, which is God's written law, depend all human laws. And no laws should be suffered to contradict these. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are suffering all kinds of laws today that contradict these, which means they are no law at all. Continuing to quote from William Blackstone in his commentaries on the laws of England. This is what our founding fathers were thinking when they were enshrining our founding documents. He says, the laws of God are binding over all the globe in all countries and at all times. No human laws are of any validity if contrary to this. And such of them as are valid derive all their force and all their authority immediately or immediately from this original. The doctrines thus delivered we call the revealed or divine law, and they are found only in the Holy Scriptures. So ladies and gentlemen, just like the English Parliament in the 1640s said, no, the king is not the supreme law of the land. In fact, the king is bound to the same laws that all people everywhere are bound by. The king cannot murder. The king cannot steal. Just like all of us, the king is also bound by the law. Well, the same is true here and everywhere. And we need our sheriffs, we need our states, we need our governors, we need our state representatives, we need our mayors, we need our county commissions to stand up and say, look, that's a nice statute you have, that's a nice regulation you have, but unfortunately, it's not in line with the supreme law of the land. It would be a violation of my oath of office to help you enforce that. It would be a violation of my oath of office to allow you to enforce that. And they need to interpose. 
Uh, one of the greatest books on this subject is written by Pastor Matt Truhella. I highly recommend that you get a copy. And give a copy to your state and local officials. I've given a lot of copies to mine. Uh, and it goes through the history of this doctrine of lesser magistrates, where lesser magistrates are standing up against the tyranny, the lawlessness, the wickedness of higher magistrates. And ladies and gentlemen, we need to learn from our forefathers. That is how they kept tyranny in check. That is how they ensured that we could have liberty today. And that's how we're going to ensure that we can pass liberty on to the next generation. It's going to be by having our state and local officials stand up and say, no, I took an oath to the Constitution. It's having our military officers say, no, I took an oath to the Constitution. I didn't take an oath to a president. I didn't take an oath to a governor. I took an oath to the document that enshrines the timeless principles of good government that God has revealed to man, and we're going to stand on those. Now, uh, before I hop off, we have a, a preview for a movie that is absolutely amazing that we want to show you quickly. It's called Beneath Sheep's Clothing. And so, um, Julie, where is it that people can sign up to watch that? Beneath Sheep's Clothing dot movie. For those of you watching us on TV, Beneath Sheep's Clothing dot movie. It's going to be coming out very soon, next month. It's going to be amazing. Uh, not because it has me in it, but because it's an incredibly well done film on an incredibly significant topic. Great Americans like uh, Trevor Loudon, great Americans like Dr. James Lindsay are featured in there. So let's show you this preview and then we'll bring up our next speaker. Here's the thing about communism. When it comes knocking at your door, it doesn't say, hi, I'm here to impoverish, enslave, and murder you. It says, I'm here to liberate you from oppression. I thought of myself as a happy kid. I had no idea that I was being brainwashed. So the KGB agents would go into the church and then rise up. That's right. All of them is infiltrated. This was a rape of the body of Christ. You take over the colleges of education, then you take over all the teachers, then you take over all the students, and thus you get the future. He said the ultimate objective of having government school was to destroy Christianity. Those were his words. People's war means to destroy the opposing country through unconventional methods. And Khrushchev bragged about it. You know, we'll take America without firing a shot. In other words, Marxism-Leninism ideology is being pumped into the soft heads of American students without being challenged. The result, the result you can see. There are ravening wolves in sheep's clothing all over the place. 